Okay. Thank you, Dr. Outlaw, for having me. Uh, my name is Andy Page. I'm a professor. I'm an ed tech specialist in Savannah, and I'm thankful for the luxuries of technology because I'm still getting to work in the last frontier of Alaska, uh, where I'm actually having class tonight. And but I am physically uh, in Georgia, and I'm going to share with you today about uh, augmented reality and e-learning and this is part of a workshop, a uh, three-hour workshop that I have done, and uh, the latest, greatest technologies uh, that uh, deal with augmented reality, what it is, and uh, during my workshop, we build things in augmented reality, and we are going to hopefully maybe do a little bit of that today. Uh, in the short time that we have. So here's my overview of what is augmented reality and why augmented reality. We're going to look at the theoretical foundations in augmented um, that uh, apply uh, the theories behind it, the latest research from the last couple of years. And I'm going to show you a personal project with AR, uh, with AR. I'm very, very much um, enamored with uh, project-based learning and problem-based learning, or what has been called challenge-based learning. And so I'm going to share with you a real-life project. And if you have access to uh, a uh, printer, uh, and you can print, uh, if you can print out the QR code, it says Zooburst story uh, code. Uh, and it is something that uh, I think you will, if you can't print it out now, do save it and it will um, be something you want to try later on because you're going to be uh, hopefully dazzle dazzle today. The, the eye candy coefficient with uh, augmented reality is very high. And, but my thing, my big takeaway then the takeaway that I want you to have today is, you know, where, what is the learning? And where is the learning? And so, if any time along the way, if you have a question, uh, please uh, feel free to type it in. Uh, there are no stupid questions whatsoever. And um, if something strikes you, uh, please, uh, you feel led to ask a question. That is how we learn through the dialectic. So... Moving right along. All of this kind of builds on the technology um, you may be familiar with, um, with something like the Xbox Connect, where you are becoming immersed in the technology uh, that you can be using, leverage the technology to do something on the physical side. Um, the exercise, the the virtual tennis, um, but that was way back when, in 2010, when that first came out. And what I'm going to focus on today really is how can augmented reality be used in an educational context, and why should it be? So, first off, you know, what is it? I'm going to show you some specific examples, uh, and hopefully, if you Get, if you have access to a printer, you can print out the story code, uh, then you will have participated in an augmented reality uh, scenario. But it's basically taking the physical world uh, and enhancing it. Uh, and it is a new way of seeing um, that comes from the Educause New Media Institute. Um, the definition, I guess, I like the best, uh, that it is, it's not virtual reality, um, but it is an enhancement of the reality that we uh, experience <laughs> each and every day. One of the best examples would be uh, like a football game. And imagine that you are watching football on TV, and it doesn't matter if it's professional or college. And hey, they, you, you would see on screen 
a yellow line usually, which is an indicator of a first down marker. Okay, it's not a real line per se. Uh, um, they don't have to erase it, uh, you know, physically. But it is taking the current reality again and enhancing it. And I'm going to show you how to use um, augmented reality as being used in a couple of things like in uh, courses of anatomy, uh, how it can be used um, in K through 12 and in higher education. And this is just another thing here that it's being used. So you may have seen some of these little QR codes, these little square codes that uh, are uh, in newspapers and magazines and so engineering, design, yeah, manufacturing, there's lots of applications. Uh, and again, my thing is, you know, what about the learning? Does this really enhance our learning? So the theoretical framework, where's all this grounded at? Why AR? Yes, there is a lot of um, visual gratuitous eye candy, but is it? Really gratuitous. Do we really need it? Uh, so think back on your learning theory um, courses, Bandura and Dogotsky, and talking about the importance of the interaction, the social interaction, and the social context. And then building on that, the situated learning, situated cognition theories that came out in the late 90s about the quality and that, hey, all learning takes place within a specific context. That when I'm in Alaska, there is a specific context there. Uh, and it's usually a cold context. Uh, and there's a specific context in Savannah, uh, Georgia. And, but the context of online learning uh, and the interactions among the people, the places, the objects, the processes. So enhancing the quality is, is again, dependent. And this has been shown in many, many studies since then. It's a very seminal, uh, all, all of those citations there are very foundational with uh, learning theory. So what does the latest research say? Well, I, I went to the Horizon Report. If you're not familiar with the Horizon Report, there's a link at the bottom. Uh, and also, I aggregate all the links at the end of the presentation, so they're all in one pile there for you. The Horizon Report's done every year. It's not just a unilateral, one person thought of something, hey, um, no. It's multinational, uh, multilingual, multi-perspective. Hey, it's a duplicity of people from around the world. And they look at not only what is on the horizon now, but what is going to be on the horizon in the next five years. And they publish this report not only for higher education, which is the example that I'm using here, but it also uh, applies to K through 12. And it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, you don't get as much bias as you would with one individual when you have 50 individuals. Uh, and they put together a very nice report. It is free. It is downloadable. Uh, it does have pictures. And it's, um, it's a good read. And um, if you want to know if, hey, is this going to be the next big thing? You know? And it seems like we just go through cycle after cycle of next big thing. Uh, and is this really going to be, I don't know, uh, to be honest with you. <clears throat> the jury's still out. I'll let you make a decision, let you make a, a well-informed decision after today. If it's not the next biggest thing, uh, I will say this, that I think it is a thing. Uh, that it is something that does uh, have potential. Uh, to enhance and enrich the learning experience. And I can say that with a lot of uh, certainty because of the work uh, that I've done with uh, students and their qualitative responses about what they uh, experienced with it. 
So, according to the e-learning industry website, that um, hey, it's an augmented feature. And it's not only going to involve QR codes with this augmented reality, but you may have heard about the Google Glass and these other haptic devices that deal uh, with enhancing uh, the world around us. Okay, and um, I'm going to talk with you a little bit about my, what Microsoft is doing in a second. But the the portability, the mobility, um, the convenience with what is uh, you're able to do with this augmented reality. You can hold your smartphone app up. If you're traveling in a foreign country with a foreign language, and you can hold that your phone up, and it will translate what, as it is in this picture here on the right, um, you know, the language into uh, another language, one language to the next. And so, hey, now you may have seen some places where you can go, if you're going to a new city um, and you need directions. Yes, you could ask Siri to give you directions, but what if you, and that's auditory, for the most part, and then it'll usually, hey, come up to a little map, and it's usually two-dimensional, a two-dimensional map that's flat on your uh, portable device, be it a smartphone or a, some kind of iPad or tablet, but it's usually two-dimensional. The beauty of augmented reality is, hey, we're going three-dimensional, and I'll show you because a picture is going to be worth a thousand words here. Imagine the um, you wanted to, for example, do uh, interior, do some interior decorating, and holding up your portable, your mobile device with a certain app. And yes, I'm going to give you links to uh, at the end of the uh, presentation two ways that students can construct these. Um, scenarios, um, and and in this case, you're doing interior decorating. What would it look like hypothetically if we were to put the green couch? Uh, yeah, or do I need the black desk? How would that look? And so it's this informal learning environment that it's not in a linear row of a classroom. That most learning takes place informally anyway. Uh, I mentioned the portability, the mobility, that having that portable device, uh, that it is constructivist, um, and in some cases social constructivist, that you are constructing knowledge or constructing a reality or constructing an augmented reality. And of course, uh, you're able to share this. You also, in this case, there's several hands there uh, in front of you in the picture that you could say that, hey, this was uh, got multiple perspectives, that it is participatory, that we do learn from our experiences. So ex experiential learning, we build on that prior knowledge, and we can look and we can compare, and we can contrast what is going on here with the the green couch or the green chair, hmm, you know, and without having to physically schlep that heavy couch over and put it down, um, and then to see what it, you know, really looks like. Okay, and so as rhetorically, is uh, augmented reality the next big trend? Yeah. Don't answer. We'll think. Um, but let me pause right there. Um, uh, and see if there's any questions or any comments, any clarifications on any of that. And that was, uh, if you heard my um, me swallowing, that was me swallowing, if you heard that. <coughs> but please, um, I see some people are typing in some questions. That's great. Uh, let's interact. And um, so astronomy, obviously we all can't be like uh, Matt Damon or whoever it was in the movie and go to uh, be the last Martian. And, uh, but um, hey, we could do a virtual tour of Mars. 
And so, to that end, the um, Microsoft has partnered with NASA to allow users of the new. Well, it's not. It's so new that it's not even out yet. And it's called the Hololens, um, and they're going to be using it uh, so that they can simulate what it's like, and not just simulate what it's like to be on just any planet, but they're going to be able to simulate what it's like to be on Mars with the help of that uh, Curiosity rover that's up there. And um, I provide that link, though I didn't on the earlier page about the augmented reality trends. There's a website there. And yes, <clears throat> we are going to discuss specific apps. And I can, can't give you a, an opinion on every app, but uh, I'm going to give you an opinion on some that um, I have used, some that I like, some that I didn't, some that um, I am still using, and um, an educational context. So, yeah. Um, and I would be you know, um, open to any suggestions for anybody. Uh, I have bought the glasses, but um, I have a pug nose. Uh, you could probably see it in that picture there. And so having glasses, it was too much weight on my nose. Uh, and, yeah, and to complicate things, I'm farsighted, which means that seeing things up uh, close uh, is difficult for me. I can see, you know, a car eight miles away on a clear day, right? But to see something, you know, eight inches from my face is difficult. So these glasses, I and mean, that's a caveat I would offer to anybody that uh, is considering buying Google glasses and uh, or this HoloLens. I got a picture of the HoloLens, yeah, on the next page, in the next slide. This isn't due out until next year, so you can't get it for a holiday present this go around, but maybe next year. It's running right off right now around $3,000. The glasses that I use, I didn't do Google Glass, but I did one, and I'll even type in the name. I think it was V-U-Z-I-K or V-U-Z-I-X. Yeah, V-U-Z-I-X, Musics. And this was... About a couple of years ago, well, I was in Alaska, and, and I thought, you know, I've got to take these long flights, as anybody does living in Alaska, and, you know, I'll just put on those glasses, and I'll watch a movie right there and on these glasses, okay? And so, yeah, again, you can see the headache that I got from being farsighted, and the Vuesix.com has hopefully improved on the... Um, the glasses, I've made them even lighter. Uh, I have to have, a, again, a very light frame on my glasses. And it was just too much weight. But they come with little earbuds right there. You know, they're battery powered. And you just put the earbuds in. You know, I just hope that nobody gets run over by, uh, you know, a train or something while they're wearing these things. But uh, the, um, the picture... On the first slide, I must tell you, um, there's a picture that was done um, back, and I don't know if I can go back to that first slide without making everybody dizzy, uh, but, but it sh it's with some work that's being done here at Savannah Tech, and combining 3D printing and augmented reality, and they're doing both so that we have a really rich environment. And so, again, this is not something that Andy's just pontificating about that uh, is done at a distance. Um, I am definitely immersed in this stuff. And uh, here we go. This is a great one. Uh, and this particular picture, I took it. Uh, and these are some special glasses that uh, are being used by Professor Stephen Hopkins here at Savannah Tech. And the... Uh, Industrial Technology Center, and he's teaching uh, some electrical engineering and he's showing uh, ways that we can wire this and that without all, you know, the hazards of, you know, of electrocution, right? And, but he's also showing cause and effect, and one of the things that I'm, again, really interested in is the learning 
And so we're able to see, you know, compare and contrast the way things are. We can do the the uh, cause and effect that when one switch is, uh, you know, thrown, what happens. And there is um, there's a link, and again, these all these links are going to be at the end. But this is just a again a real up close personal example of um, leveraging the glasses uh, to make it um, you know an enhanced environment. And I would be the first to admit that I'm very critical. I'm very um, you know critical about technology. Uh, and that play the devil's advocate is this, you know, and I ask myself all the time, is this gratuitous? Is this necessary? Is this, you know, just eye candy? Or is there really something there? And the, I'll let you be the judge and um, just tell you the facts. Um, somebody mentioned earlier about, um, I think it was um, Helen was asking about uh, some specific apps. This is one in particular that, that does a, an anatomy 4D. Okay? And there's a link at the bottom that will go to it. And um, again, portability. Hands-on, minds-on. And I will tell you, in my, um, my workshop, the, the actual presentation that I do in this augmented three-hour augmented reality workshop it's on my website, okay, and it's under projects. It's in the same place that I will uh, house this presentation. But in that presentation, it goes even more. It, it shows, um, you know, somebody in a physics class, and then you've got the anatomy class, and it, and it shows, uh, you know, their anatomy uh, coming right out from their body. Um, you'll have to see it. And again, it's not virtual reality because virtual reality would be like second life. Um, we would be in it, um, immersed in it 100%. This is just taking the reality that we have and kind of playing with it, enhancing it. Again, remember that football um analogy or example, uh, that first down marker. Hey, transformative learning, I'm all there. I really believe that, yeah, you could say all learning is transformative, but how do you know if it's epistemically, you know, it's going to change the epistemology of somebody and take somebody who's, you know, pulling for uh, Lindsey Graham, and then they're going to vote for uh, Bernie Sanders. They have a, a really serious transformation that's going to have to take place. And transforming the classroom, uh, how can we do that? And you can see this example. I'm going to show you some pictures like this in a second with me. And, um, yeah, uh, holding uh, out my... Um, yeah, virtual um, book. This is an ex another example here that shows a designer, uh, you know, again, the two-dimensional way on the right with the motorcycle, which is great, okay? But don't you think it's more authentic, maybe? The authenticity? No, it's not a real motorcycle in either diagram. But it's a closer approximation of a real, you know, and hey, we could test it and wreck it a hundred thousand times uh, in a virtual context or an augmented context, and nobody's blood is shed. And uh, but you know, we could test it out with uh, all the aerodynamics and see if this particular metal uh, is better. A better alloy, but more aerodynamic. These wheels are better. Yeah, again, that cause and effect. One of the best ways that we strategies that we use to learn. Okay, this is really. How am I doing on time here? Um, okay, four twenty-six here. So this is uh, 
the, the Zooburst story code. And what it is, is a glorified QR code. What is a QR code? It's a quick read. Uh, there's one on the front page of this uh, particular presentation. You may have been to conferences uh, where people give their business card that have the QR code on it. Hey, what does it do? Well, it digitizes somebody's contact information. You could have it so that when they scan it, it goes to a website or a video opens up. All kinds of great things happen. So this has an this is a link. There's a Zooburst app link. I haven't put in the link to the Alaska ebook. It's on my website. But and this is it. And what I I wish I could be with you to share this with you. Um, there's a direct link, but and this is a K through 12 example where you've got. Hey, everybody, when you're a kid, likes pop-up books. Who doesn't like pop-up books? Everybody likes them. This one actually pops off the screen. I'm going to show you pictures of me holding the book off the virtual book. But the whole learning aspect of this is, again, what is so incredible. This was done in 2012 in Alaska in a kindergarten, first grade classroom and who were paired up with a fourth and fifth grade classroom. Hey, they're book buddies. The fourth and fifth graders are working with this kindergarten and first graders on how to read. So I'm thinking, hey, you know, instead of book buddies, why don't you become e-book buddies, you know, electronic books. And instead of just reading somebody else's book, why don't, we, why don't we write our own book? And why don't we call it the ABCs of Alaska? And so, that is my awful picture uh, of me on the right, and this is kind of toward the end of the ebook. But if you can see it, my hand, I'm holding up a piece of paper, and there's actually th the book on the left. Okay, and this picture was actually taken, um, yeah, very recently, uh, as Dr. Outlaw knows, with my procrastination, and but it shows me with the beard and in the photo. Um, and working with the kids in Alaska. And there's the book. I'm holding it in my hand. And it's, just, it's, it's, it's really hard for you to really appreciate it because it's two-dimensional here. And so if you were to print out that story code that I'm holding up in the background there, and it's like a backwards Z and the letter B for Zoom Burst, and you turn on your webcam... That book pops off the screen, and it looks like you know it's between me and the screen, um, and again three dimensional. Uh, it can be multimedia. See the little question mark if, if a, a student or a user of this book, and it's on my website. You, you click, you click uh, on the question mark, and the moose makes a sound. Okay. All of the learning objects, these graphics, the, um, the sounds, all of this was part of a library within the Zooburst um, um, uh, what do you call it? The, not only the website, but it, it's within the, um, the yeah, I guess it would be a library, but it's a Web 2.0 type tool. And Helen, yes, you do, because I'm not one. Again, I am the co I'm more interested in the cognitive side. Um, again, I, I see people, you know, techno geek or whatever. No, I am an early adopter, and, but I, I'm more, much more concerned about the learning, the cognitive side. Uh, how are we doing on time? We've got... Uh, 14 minutes or so. But yeah, you, know, you may have read this article that was published a couple of years ago about uh, Minds on Fire. It's on the internet. Um, it's done by Educause, and hey, if John Seeley Brown wrote it, um, we participate. Instead of, I think, therefore I am, it's that we participate. These kiddos did this. 
And I did not teach them anything. I was the guide on the side who was facilitating their learning. Because it's portable, they were able to take it with them. I debriefed parents uh, about this. Uh, the Zubris website's incredible. It's done by a professor up in New York, and he um, made, has created a safe environment so the kids can log in and work together collaboratively. And they can do what I call the four C's. Uh, to communicate, to coordinate, to construct, and connect. Here's an example of the puffin. If you've ever been in, up to Alaska, you know about the puffins. And, and yeah, again, the text, what they did involved sound. Um, it was cross-curricular, social constructive, project-based learning. I just observed and took a lot of copious notes and yeah, would love to publish an article about this uh, because there's some significant, there was no worry about the, the locus of control, uh, the self-motivation of these, um, these learners. They were there and uh, it was what I call hands-on, minds-on. This is just another example. I apologize, it's a little blurry, and, but the, uh, the seal, S is for seal, they had to, you know, again, each letter of the alphabet, and it's something that dealt with Alaska, you know, something that started with the letter S. And, you know, in the real world, we collaborate, we communicate, we connect, and we construct reality. And like you're doing now. And, hey, this much better picture cue. And then, again, this is a virtual um, augmented book that's coming off the stream between myself, that piece of paper that has those QR codes on it. And, but you don't have to be a technical genius. Um, there is a manual uh, for this particular Zubers program, some people like a manual. That's great. There is the feedback that I got was, "Hey, kindergarten and first graders working with fourth and fifth graders," and yes, those are the millennial generation. But I tell you, it was um, a very, very poignant scenario that you didn't have to worry about discipline. Uh, these kids were on task. Their focus, um, yeah, it was relevant for them in so many ways. Did we meet academic yearly progress, AYP? Did we teach to the standards of an Alaska? Absolutely. So sidetracking real quick, I've, I've got about just a few minutes. I know we're going to have some time for more questions and answers, but thank you, Helen. Um, there is a, another program called Erasma that has a, a library of what are being called RL, RLOs, these reusable learning objects. And this is just a snapshot. I mean, it's nowhere near the level of uh, how much stuff is available, but it's just a snapshot of one page uh, that we are as you can see, they're about midway, changing educational paradigms. Absolutely. That, you know, I was thinking during the last, I said in the last presentation about this uh, turn it in and cheating and everything, and, you know, I didn't have, didn't have to worry about anybody cheating on this project-based learning. And it was in hands-on, minds-on. Um, I've been an educator for going on 25 years, I don't think, I can't remember, it's been at least 15 years since I gave a test, an actual exam. Oh, project-based learning, students presenting, and um, yeah, now a lot of you could say that's graduate school, what graduate school teachers do, but this, uh, you know, I put the linear directions for this Erasmus Studio to launch it, boom, boom, boom. 
been my experience that most learners like that linear one, two, three approach. So mobile technology, you hear all this stuff about PLEs, these personal learning environments, this, this need for kinesthetic learning, this hands-on, minds-on. The um, SketchUp is another one, uh, a program that is um, it was, uh, I think, owned by Google, which it, you know is most of the world anyway. But um, some of the fields, uh, people that like to do this is more of a higher education thing. Even though there is a K through 12 there, uh, and but in an example of creating things with an entirely free 3D drawing tool, then working past that uh, two dimensions. And so to wrap up things uh, in the last couple of minutes here, again, the focus is the learning, not the eye candy, uh, not the wow quotient. Um, in my opinion, I've been working with this stuff uh, for the last, the last four, five years, that, yeah, it can, and it does when it's done right, Enhance the learning experience. It enhances that quality that I mentioned earlier. And it's not expensive, and you don't have to be a techno genius. And no, I don't work for any of these companies at the moment. I'm not trying to sell you anything. Just trying to be objective as humanly possible, and, and just report back to you. But um, I don't feel like there is a steep learning curve uh, of this emerging technology. Some of the other terms there, the compiled resources at the end. There's even, I even put in a QR code generator that I use to create colorful QR codes, like the yellow one on the front of the, the um, presentation. And Dr. Outlaw knows, and I think I uh, sent her an email, and I had my, the QR code at the bottom that somebody can easily digitize my contact information for all of what it's worth. But um, yeah, there I am. The link to the website, the QR code, and I ask you: Is that fireplace real, or is it virtual? And um, so we hopefully have a second or two for questions or comments. And um, I don't know if I need to throw up about the mic, um, but Dr. Outlaw. <laughs> you bet it's virtual, huh? <laughs> yeah, if anybody has any questions, you can type it in, in the chat box or I can advance your audio and let you speak. Uh, we have about six or so more minutes before we close for the day. Um, again, for those of you who may have come in late, you can get the handouts from this presentation at the bottom right box. Just click on mm -hmm. the file and then click the file. It really takes more time to, to really get into it. The, the workshop, uh, the presentation from the, this workshop that I've done, is, is done in Prezi. It's on my website. And, uh, yeah. And it is a, um, a presentation that goes more into detail. I have the time to, to like I did with those... Uh, kiddos up in Alaska to, to come by and to be that guide on the side and work with you one-on-one -on -one and or, you know, in groups of two. But, uh, it's some amazing stuff. Um, and if you take the time to print out this, this story code, holding it up to you, I just wish I could be there to live vicariously through your experience. Uh, and, Well, thank you so very much. Uh, appreciate that, Helen. Any questions? Um, do some exploring. I know you'll be surprised, um, and um, it's not—it it doesn't cost anything to create these little QR codes that I created here. And I've been to other conferences, and they instead of they would have those little uh, on the. Um, uh, right outside of the conference. This is a, one of those physical conferences, Dr. Outlaw, where they, you, know, you could just scan it and then you would get 
a more robust. There's some videos um, on my website that, uh, wow. that I would recommend. Yeah, I think they're great. I just left an egg tech conference about two weeks ago, and mm -hmm. one of the presentations was all about QR codes, and he had them kind of pasted up around the room on a piece of paper, and we were able to just take our cell phones and uh, snap the picture, and it took us directly to the website. Um, yes, yes. Whether it was his website or the, um, uh, to his survey and things of that sort, so I thought that was... Pretty neat. Absolutely. You know, again, I ask myself, you know, where's the learning? What is this? How's this expediting the process of learning? Maybe, you know, getting more information. There's uh, an incredible video on my website in the in that presentation. Um, it's called Creativity in Education, and the guys at a zoo. And if you've ever been to a zoo, that you know, sometimes the animals are not there. You're right in front of you. This guy goes up. He wants to see this green snake or something, and it's not there. But there's a QR code, and he scans it, and it goes into this video uh, with much more information about this green snake or green lizard, you know. And so he's leveraging the technology in an educational context in an informal manner. And uh, yeah. So uh, I love the creative creative aspect of it. So thank you for sharing that. Okay. Well, Dr. Page, I appreciate you um, participating and presenting in this conference. Mm -hmm. uh, I thank you. I th you know, hats off to you. Uh, I'm impressed. Like I said when we spoke the other day about how much work you have done and. Um, yeah, in such a short amount of time, I'm blown away, uh, and I'm sincerely mean that uh, professionally. Uh, this, yeah, you've really done a lot of work and for a great cause. Sharing knowledge is a beautiful thing, and you should be commended. Thank you so much. Mm. But this is your hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay.